And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he may be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah. The year is 2018. Some of the greatest architects in Mexico have come together to build the Arts Betagal Shopping Center. The heart of Mexico City is featuring some of the greatest art installations, immaculate sculptures. It's going to be this over four million four, uh, square foot shopping mall in the heart of Mexico City. It's absolutely breathtaking architecture. Uh, the brands that are featured there are Louis Vuitton, Cartier, you know, Gucci, all the stuff that I usually wear every day, you know, <laughs> just like me. And, uh, and you Portlanders will be very glad to hear your favorite coffee shop was opening the first Starbucks reserve in, <laughs> at, at this place. But they're, they're going to build this absolutely luxurious, decadent, spectacular shopping mall. And right as they begin to finish, there is an instantaneous collapse where the entire thing is decimated into a cloud of smoke, dust, glass, and twisted metal. Fortunately, nobody was harmed, nobody died in this, but you can actually watch footage of the collapse. And what it was was that certain developers in Mexico City had chosen to uh, want to make a quick return on this and had built it upon an unreliable foundation and it actually used subpar building materials. And even though they had the greatest artists, the greatest designs, the greatest ambitions, the greatest... Uh, uh, you know, hopes for it, that it would turn a, an enormous profit because they used a poor foundation, because they used these subpar building materials, it all went up in a puff of smoke in an instant. Well, like that mall in Mexico, what I want to say to you in this, in this series, Identity Crisis, is, is essentially this, that we're all building our lives upon something. We're, we're building our lives uh, our identity, who we are, what we believe is valuable, what we believe is important, what we believe makes life worth living. We're building it upon something. And what I've been proposing to you last week and then this week and then also be talking about next week is that if you build your life upon anything other than God, it will inevitably make you into a fragile person. It will make you into a person who is deeply vulnerable to circumstance, deeply vulnerable to, to, uh, to suffering, to difficulty, to adversity. 
if you, if you build your life on anything other than God, all suffering can do to you is thwart your meaning. All it can do is sabotage your purpose. You see, suffering is going to happen. I regret to, I'm, I'm really sorry to tell you, but like, life is going to get hard. Stuff is going to happen. Things aren't going to go your way. And you can try to avoid suffering like we do, and we should. You know, I'm not saying we should seek out suffering or anything. But, but, but suffering is going to come your way. Difficulty is going to come your way. And, and, and all suffering can do for you, if you build your life on secular pursuits, if you build it on career and romance, and, and, and none of these things are bad in and of themselves, but, but if you put all of your hope and all of your identity and all of your system of meaning and all of your system of value in, into these pursuits like career and finances and experiences and romances, you are going to be incredibly devastated and crushed when circumstance comes, when that breakup happens, when the economy crashes, when you lose that job, when, when somebody uh, outshines you at the workplace, all of a sudden, your identity is going to come crashing down like the mall in Mexico. So the title of my message today in the series Identity Crisis is this, Fragile versus Indestructible. Fragile versus Indestructible. And, uh, and the first thought that comes from the passage that April just read to us which, by the way, is, is considered like the Mount Everest of Scripture. It's considered like the high point of Scripture. I'm just not wasting any time. It's week three. I'm like, let's tackle it. Let's tackle Everest. We're just going to the, the biggest one. But, but I couldn't think of a better passage that really sums up how our identity in Christ makes us durable, how it makes us resilient to suffering. There really is no better text that hits on it. So I went straight, straight for the bullseye and went to Romans 8, 28 to 39. But the first... Uh, part I want to pull out from this text is, is your purpose versus God's purpose. So we're saying fragile versus indestructible. The first thought we're pulling out is this, your purpose versus God's purpose. So I'll re- read you the, the beginning passage. of The first verse is very famous. We know that all things God works together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For those God's foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Now, verse 28 is super famous, okay? It's, it's one of those verses, kind of like John 3, 16, or, you know, Philippians 4, 13, that, like, athletes write it on their shoe. You know, I'm looking at you, Steph Curry. But, like, but, like, but you know, like, it, it's one of those verses that are just so famous, and taken by itself, verse 28 can almost sound like a Hallmark card, can't it? It can, it can seem like something like your grandma would buy at Hobby Lobby and like hang in her bathroom, you know, and, and you'd hang it up like, and we all things work together for good, like every cloud has its silver lining. You know, it, it can feel that way. It can feel incredibly trite. And I want to make abundantly clear that the Bible Christian culture is different than actual Jesus following Christianity, by the way, okay? Christian culture is not always the same as what the Bible actually teaches. So let me just tell you that, 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 that the Bible has a huge teaching about empathy and about lament and about how it's okay sometimes to just scream at God and, and, for, and for your, to weep and that, I mean, Paul weeps. Jesus weeps, Jeremiah weeps, the psalmist weeps. It's okay to weep. Like, I'm, I'm not saying well, what we should do is just downplay our hurt and, and smile, 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 you know, just smile on by. The birds are singing. Like, like that is not at all what biblical Christianity looks like. I mean, just read the Psalms, read Lamentations, read pretty much turn anywhere into your Bible, and, and, and it has an incredibly realistic view of suffering. As a matter of fact, the, the scripture was written by oppressed people. It was written by people who, who, who had experienced difficulty uh, far beyond what any of us have probably experienced. I mean, I mean most of the authors of scripture are people fa- living in like dungeons, and like I've actually been to the place where Paul was imprisoned in Rome, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's like sewage flowing by. Like, these are people well acquainted with difficulty. But what it's saying is this, is that there is a purpose big enough to handle the reality of suffering. That there's a purpose that exists 
that, that's not just like a little like band-aid you put on, you know, just, just a little uh, thing you crochet on a pillow or something. But, but no offense if you love crocheting. <laughs> but, but like, <laughs> but, but like, but that, there, that there's a purpose that is rich, that is deep enough, that can handle real pain, real hardship, real suffering. And I think it's, we really do ourselves a disservice when we only read verse 28 by itself. Because what comes after Romans 28, 28 is 29. And, and 28 talks about how God has this good, that he's working all things together for good, and that he has a purpose. And we stop there, we're like, ah, oh, he's got a good, and he's got a purpose. It's like, well, what the heck is the good? <laughs> like, what is the purpose? What's the point that he's worrying to? And that's what 29 tells us. It says that he's working everything that we would be conformed to the image of the Son. In other words, that we would become more like Jesus. And if you know your Bible at all, I mean, probably it's familiar, even, even to most people who didn't grow up around the Bible, have probably heard it, but the, but the Bible starts with saying that God made human beings in his image. In other words, we were made to be reflections of him. Uh, the, the picture of Christian theology is this, that, that God is this being of infinite love, infinite holiness, this, this perfect being, in that we are meant to be reflections of his love, that we're meant to reflect his love to one another. But what does the Bible say? It says that we shattered the image, that we shattered, we shattered that image. We don't reflect his love, but we don't reflect his holiness. We don't reflect his goodness, but that his purpose in everything is to kind of gather up the glass pieces, put everything back into place so that we do reflect the image of Jesus, the image of the Son. That is God's purpose. God's purpose for you, you may have a purpose. You may have like, this is my goal in life. You know, my goal is to make this many figures or, or to like buy a house in, in uh, Irvington. <laughs> you know, like good luck, dream on. But, but, like, but, but, but you, you may have this purpose for yourself but God's purpose is this, that you would be courageous as Jesus, that you'd be as loving as Jesus, that you'd be as humble as Jesus, as gentle as Jesus, as bold as Jesus, as holy as Jesus. That is God's purpose for your life. And God says that he, I mean, this is astronomical, it's, it's staggering, but the idea is that God in, in, in his infinite power and wisdom is orchestrating everything so that many brothers and sisters would be in the image of Christ. That everything he's doing is being orchestrated and superintended to move you towards that purpose. I love this quote by George MacDonald. George MacDonald says this, the Son of God suffered not so that you would not suffer, but that when we suffer, we would be like him. That, that Jesus' purpose isn't just to like make all your dreams come true and give you an easy life and, and bless you and make you rich and, and, and healthy and perfect and, and you know, make you famous and get you lots of followers on TikTok or like whatever. Like, but th that his purpose, the reason he suffered was to restore the image, to restore us back to this place where we reflect his love and his goodness back to him and to one another. And here is what I've discovered, okay? Because there are people who've suffered more than me, certainly, but if you come to counterculture long enough, you're going to discover that I, I have suffered probably more than the average person my age. Okay, I've been, I've been through some extremely difficult things, and I'm just going to kind of leave that mysterious, and you can come and find out more about it as the weeks go on. <laughs> but uh, I've suffered a lot in my life, but here's what I've discovered. You will experience peace to the extent that your purpose aligns with God's purpose. You will experience, you're going to be a Christian, you'll be like, doesn't the Bible promise peace that surpasses understanding? I don't have any peace. I'm a Christian. I don't have any peace. But here's the thing. Is your goal the same as God's goal? Is your goal aligning with God's goal? Is your greatest desire, your greatest passion, the source of your meaning, the source of your identity, is it the same as God's desire? That is what truly brings peace. If your priority your purpose, your goal is something else, your identity is something else, you will not have peace. <laughs> you will have strife, you will have anxiety, 
you will have frustration, you will have difficulty. I mean, and, and, the, and like we said last week, these are good things, right? They're good things. Genesis 1 starts off, God says, everything's good. Everything in heaven is good. Everything on earth is good. All these things are good things. But I quoted Keller last week and said, when you take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing, it can become a bad thing. So I want to say this. If your purpose is romance, and, and it's having that perfect partner and having that romantic relationship and, and getting the right swipe on Tinder or on Bumble or on, or on Hinge or on whatever else. You know, if, if your identity comes from your appearance and how good you look and how attractive you are and how thin you are and how beautiful you are and, and how, how, you know, you're, you just got the fit that drips, <laughs> you know. If, if your identity comes from your finances, and, and, and your, you know, 401k or whatever, your stocks, your portfolios, your investments, or, or, or it comes from, from uh, um, your political pursuits and, and whether or not your political party is dominating and whether you're achieving those political ambitions. If your purpose and your chosen identity is any of those things, it will be fragile. You'll be up one four-year cycle and then devastated down. Literally, people were calling suicide hotlines, you know, because their, their candidate lost in the last several elections. I mean, I mean, you, you, what are you going to do when that partner cheats on you? If they're your identity, if they're your everything. And what are you going to do when that spouse dies? Because then inevitably, one, you know, person in the marriage is going to be burying the other person at one point. What are you going to do when you lose that job, when you face difficulty in your career. I mean, all of these things will make us sad. That's why I said it's okay to weep. It's okay to lament. But if it's your, if it's your life, if it's your very purpose for getting out of bed in the morning, if it's, if it's the only reason you live is for this thing, you're not just going to be sad and weeping. You're going to be despondent. You're going to be absolutely distraught. You're not going to be able to go on. A supreme example of this comes from the, the wild world of sports, <laughs> okay? I don't know. i got to fix this guy. Sorry about that, everybody. It's my first, this is uh, the maiden voyage for this microphone. This is first time out. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so the world of sports. There's nothing wrong with sports. Nothing wrong with athletics. But if your ultimate goal in life, if, if what you want more than anything is athletic excellence, you know, and you are just putting everything into becoming uh, a professional athlete. You know, you're going you're gonna to play for the Timbers. You're going to play for the Blazers. You're going to win a gold medal running for Nike. If that's it, what are you going to do when you have a career-ending injury? It happens, right? I mean, Dr. Masia Gervais is a sports psychologist, and she interviewed... Lots of, people, uh, lots of people who had these kinds of injuries, and she interviewed them and, and asked them this. She said, we asked if they felt anxiety or isolation, and 99% reported experiencing some kind of psychological disruption. There's a wealth of evidence around the psychological challenges of a long-term injury. If you're an elite athlete where it's your only identity, and suddenly that's been taken away from you, you're sitting there thinking, who I am? Who am I? It's a big sense of loss. See, if you build your identity on something other than Jesus, it makes you fragile. And it just takes one, one blow to the knee, one bad investment, one business partner betraying you, and, and it's gone. I mean, if it's your appearance... If, if beauty is where you really get your value, you know, you've always been told you're beautiful from the time you were little. You've always been told you were attractive, and, and that's really where you get your sense of worth. When you gain a little bit of weight, you're going to look at yourself in the mirror. You're going to hate yourself. You're going to despise yourself. When you see those wrinkles on your face, when they, when they start to come, and they're going to come for all of us. I mean, I look at my face, I'm disgusted. You know? but, like, but, like, but like, you know... <laughs> You know, you see, I'm just joking around. I, I'm fine. I'm just a dude. But uh, just a dude up here on stage in front of anyone. But, uh, but when someone's prettier than you, you know, 
they're more beautiful than you are. They're, they're fitter than you are. They, they've got the app. You're going you're to feel so worthless if that's the thing that makes your life worth living. Now, the way I like to phrase it is this. If your meaning in life is something that suffering can steal, then it's just a matter of time till your life is meaningless. I saw an ad on Instagram uh, a little while ago, and, and I, I, don't know how, I don't know what I did in the algorithm to make this man appear on my Instagram ads. <laughs> but I saw an ad on Instagram from Tony Robbins, all right? Tony Robbins, I don't know if you know who Tony Robbins is. He's this business coach. And uh, the ad, it, it, he actually said this in the ad. This is, this is a direct quote from my algorithm world, <laughs> okay? But Tony Robbins says this, business is an extension of your own identity. If business is going great, you feel great about yourself. If it's not, not so great. And uh, you know, Tony Robbins is interesting. I actually, I could not resist telling you about this. I, I was doing a little research about him. And you know, he actually made a bunch of people walk across burning hot coals at an event in Dallas. And uh, you know, like 12 people had to be hospitalized after walking across it. He's like, he's like, I know your self-esteem's down because your business is going good. But come to me, I'll make you walk across hot coals, and your feet will burn so bad you won't even think about your self-esteem. But, but, uh, but you know, he, he, uh, I'm not here to dunk on Tony Robbins. I mean, I couldn't. He's a huge man with a gravelly voice. <laughs> like, I couldn't dunk on him if I tried. I'm terrified of him. But, but I think he really gets at something. I think he really gets at something in this quote, and that's that, that's that for many of us, we make our business our identity. We make our career our identity, our world. And he goes, your business is doing well? You're doing great. Your business is not so well? See, do you realize how, how, the, how much of a house of cards that is? Do you realize how many things are outside of your control and outside of your power? And that if you give your career that much of yourself, like h- how much of a roller coaster? You're going to be an emotional yo-yo. You want to live your life like that? Like an, like an emotional yo-yo? It, 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 is, it will be unbearable. Now, Pew Research uh, actually released some data from, from, I think, this year, 2023, showing that 71% of Americans say that having a great career is more important to them than marriage. It's more important than them having children. It's more important to them than even having friends. 71% of Americans say that the most important thing in their life is that they would have a great career. And, and, and I hope that I'm being abundantly clear. None of these things are bad. Like, it's fine to want a good career. That's okay. But I'm just saying, if it's your world, if it's the thing that you place above everything, I mean, you are just setting yourself up for a world of hurt. You know, my family and I, we have this really weird habit, even with our small, tiny children, from the time like my son was like four years old, he loved to watch Shark Tank. <laughs> like, I don't know what kind of kid he is. I remember when he was four, he's sitting on the couch, I was like, he's like, let's watch Shark Tank, Dad. I'm like, okay. I mean, we showed it to him. But, but, uh, but he loved it. And I was like, what? do you even know what Shark Tank's about? And he looks up at me and goes, money. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. We were watching Shark Tank a while ago. You know, there with my four-year-old daughter. She loves it. She just wants to be just like, uh, you know, Robert Herbert Hershevik. It's, it's her idol. Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, um, we're watching Shark Tank, and there's this woman, and I, and I have compassion for this woman. I'm not here to, like, mock her and make fun of her. But she had put her whole life into making this, like, cereal company called Honey Bunchies. And, you know, she was, like, laying out Honey Bunchies to them. And, uh, and sadly, she didn't get a single deal. Like, everyone, everyone turned down investing in honey bunchies. But it was really, really sad. It was hard to watch. Where as she, all the deals were evaporating in front of her, she was going, this is everything. This is everything. Honey bunchies is everything. And, and, and the tears just started gushing down her face. And... and and we're all prone to that, right? I mean, I can make counterculture church everything. I can make this my everything. And then, you know, when I, when I, when I 
and, I, and I can be an emotional wreck about the turnout or about this or about that or about you know, whatever. But I'm just saying, if you do that, you're going to end up like Kendall Roy, okay? You're going to end up like stabbing your brother's eyes out, going like, I am the eldest boy. Like, like, like yeah, I, don't, I don't know if you saw the finale of the show. It's, it's got a lot of profanities in it. But, uh, but, but you know, at the, at the end of Succession, Kendall Roy goes, if I don't get this, I'm going to die. This is all I have. And a lot of us do that. We put ourselves, our hearts, our souls into these things, and we can't sleep at night, and our minds are racing because we're worried. Because the truth is, we are living in Tornado Alley, okay? There is a storm coming. Uh, philosophers point out that, that in the secular world, all we do is we try to reduce suffering, we try to avoid suffering. We try to eliminate suffering. And, and, I, and, and I'm a big fan of that. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan. Like, I, I, I don't want you to, like, seek out suffering. Don't take that away from this sermon. <laughs> but the truth is, like, you can take the best pain medication. You can, you can do the best physical fitness routine. You can have the best doctors. And you're still going to die. And, and you're still going to face tragedy. And you're still going to have, you can do everything you can to try to orchestrate your world. But you're going to suffer. The storm is coming. And what Romans 8 is telling us is that if we build our life on Christ, that is giving us a storm shelter. It's giving us a meaning in life that can withstand the storm. Honey bunches can't withstand the storm, all right? It can't. Like, like, like that, that, that romantic relationship, whatever else it is that you're putting your hope into, it can't withstand the storm. But you know what can? Christ can. You know that as a believer in Christ... What this text is telling us is that suffering doesn't take you from your meaning. Suffering doesn't rob you of your identity. As a matter of fact, suffering can enhance your identity. Suffering actually has the power to push you closer into your meaning in life, to push you deeper into your real identity. Because here, here's, here's the reality. What's not true for all these different examples that I've been listing, what is true of this is that you can be like Jesus in a hospital bed. You can be like Jesus when you lose your job. You can be like Jesus when you're going through an economic hardship. You can be like Jesus when your spouse betrays you. You can be like Jesus when, you, when your best friends walk out on you. Actually, those can be the opportunities where you look the most like Jesus. You see, if you make Jesus your identity, you gain a purpose in life that is durable. You gain a purpose in life that is indestructible, can drive you deeper into God and into his purposes. All right, so we're saying fragile versus indestructible. And we're saying your purpose versus God's purpose. The next thing we're going to say is karma versus grace. Karma versus grace. If you look down at me, verse 30 who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Then who is he who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus died. More than that, who's raised to life, who's at the right hand of God, also interceding for us. What shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Now, the word justification comes up in this text. If you were here week one, it actually kind of came up there with the tax collector and the Pharisee as well. But the word justification means forgiveness, but it actually means more than forgiveness. It, it, it means not only are you forgiven, it means that you are absolutely accepted. You are absolutely loved. You are ac absolutely welcomed and validated. In justification, it's not just that God clears our debt and wipes out our criminal record. It's that he gives us an all-access pass to the main event. Justification means that you are, you are adopted into the royal family, that, that, that you are brought in on the inside. It's not like, oh, you know, you're forgiven. I'm not going to punish you, and you can, I'll, I'll just tolerate you. Stay out there. It's like, no, you are justified. Come on in. Come on, and we want you here. You, you, you could, you, you've got full reign. You've got full access to everything that is in Christ. But what is all this talk of justification and condemnation? You saw that in the text. 
what does condemnation and charges and justification really have to do with suffering? Well, I'll tell you. Oftentimes when we suffer, we're left asking ourselves, do I deserve this? Did I do something to make this happen? Like, did I do something wrong and that's why my life is going wrong? And, and, and we can sit there and we can rack ourselves with guilt. And, and, and throughout history, I mean, this has been an extremely common thing. Uh, I mean, it's really what the book of Job is all about. It, uh, another example from the Bible is, is this, there's this blind dude, and they run up to Jesus and they say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You know, and and, and it's, it's easy to look at suffering and go, man, God must be punishing me. God must hate me. This is so painful. This is so horrible. This is so hard. God must be against me. God must be out to get me. Uh, you know, in Rome, he's writing to Christians living in the city of Rome. And we know they are going to be persecuted. They are going to be killed, that, uh, some of them in, in, in absolutely, you know, a brutal fashion. And the Romans looked at them. These people who believed in fate, and they believed that everything was fated, and, and they think, the gods must hate them. Look, they're being eaten by lions. They're being crucified. They're having their skin ripped off of them. You know, the gods, look, God doesn't love, the gods don't love them. You know, and, and Paul is saying the exact opposite here. It's really fascinating. Down towards the end of the text, he quotes from the Psalms, and uh, he says, Right immediately after what I just read, he says, for your sakes, we are killed all day long. We're accounted like sheep to the slaughter. Now, I've read Romans 8 dozens of times, and I've noticed that little verse there, and I always kind of felt weird, out of place to me, whatever, and we just skip over that verse from the Psalms. But uh, Tim Mackey, a friend of mine, he, he, he points out that those verses are like hyperlinks. You know when you're on a website, and you can like, click on a hyperlink, and it goes to a different web page? When the Bible does this, it's like hyperlinking back to the Psalms. And so this week I read Psalm 44, where it comes from. I'll put it on the screen for you. He says this, Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path. But you crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals. You covered over us with deep darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread our hands to a foreign idol... Would not God have discovered it, since he knows the secrets of the heart? Yet for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. So he's saying, we had done nothing wrong. We had followed God. We'd followed the covenant. We'd done everything right. And yet our, our life is still a mess. And, and what, you know, so many traditional cultures have said throughout time, and, and what even our own just human tendency is. I think you, you, you could be an atheist here, and when you suffer, you're still going to wonder these thoughts. You're going to wonder, like, man, life isn't going right. Maybe it's because I did something wrong. Like, maybe I did something to deserve it. But the Bible, Romans 8, Psalm 44, the book of Job, the, the story of Joseph, the story of Jesus, the story of Jeremiah, I mean, it all is saying just absolutely definitively and, and, and defiantly that no, sometimes you suffer and you don't deserve it. Sometimes suffering is completely unjust. Sometimes you suffer and you did nothing to cause it. Sometimes you did everything right and life still goes wrong. And this is really, really, really important. We may not realize how important it is. Because people who are suffering don't always deserve it. People who are suffering deserve love. People who are suffering deserve compassion. And this becomes really significant when we look at people who are in poverty. Because if your assumption is your life is going wrong because you did something wrong, then, then what do we look at people... <laughs> Who are on the streets. We think they deserve it. They deserve to be there. They did something wrong to be there. And, 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 that, and that's something that is very human, but it's something that the Bible categorically denies. It says that no, that you can suffer and it's not your fault. It's what the entire book of Job is about. I read a, a great book by an Indian philosopher last year named Vishal Mangawaldi. And uh, these are his words, but Vishal Mangawaldi says this, Karma 
became a philosophical factor preventing a culture of care. A person's suffering was believed to be a result of his or her own karma. By the way, the word karma, it's Sanskrit, it means deeds, it means works. We, we talk a lot about salvation by grace, not by works. The word karma means works. In a previous life, in other words, suffering was cosmic justice. To interfere with cosmic justice is like breaking into a jail and setting a prisoner free. If you cut short someone's suffering, in other words, you help someone who's suffering, you actually add to their suffering because then they, they got to come back and meet their quota. You don't help a person when you interfere with the cosmic law of justice. Many Hindus cannot believe that God cares for the poor. Now, in India, they have the caste system. I don't know if you've heard about the caste system, but it's this stratified system where it's, it, there are the, the Dalits, and there's millions upon millions of Dalits in India, and it, it's illegal to help them. They're living in the slums because they deserve it. They were born into poverty and squalor because they did something bad in a previous life. That is why they're suffering. But the Bible, it rejects that. It says, no, the world is broken. The world is fallen. The world is unjust. And sometimes, oftentimes even, people suffer even though they did nothing wrong. Now, the radical claim of Christianity is that God loves the poor. The radical claim of Christianity is that God loves those who are suffering, that God loves you when you're suffering. And its claim is this, that maybe you're here today and you're going through an incredibly difficult time, and I'm here to tell you, God loves you. God is for you. He's not against you. God is still good. And he has a good purpose for your pain. Yeah. It, it, your pain is not meaningless, that it's, it's, not, it's, it, it's, it's not worthless. God has an intent for it. Now, I have a really ready example of someone suffering and handling it and, and, and going through it with joy and honestly looking to Christ and looking like Christ. Um, I, haven't, I don't think I've certainly not shared this on stage yet, but right now my dad, who is my hero, you know, uh, uh, just unbelievably um, amazing father, uh, he is battling pancreatic cancer. And he's actually young, he's healthy, I mean, he's relatively young, but he's, he's healthy, he's energetic, he, he has like so much desire for life, but here he is, and he's battling one of the most lethal forms of cancer. And uh, you know, the whole idea of counterculture actually is a little bit connected to my dad, because I shared with you before uh, back in the late 60s and 70s, my dad was dropping acid and uh, doing speed and hitchhiking around America and reading Hindu texts and reading Buddhist texts. Some of you are like, I would love to hang out with Chip Lesko in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my spirit animal, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he was there and he, and he felt actually really lost doing that. And, and, and he wandered into a church, later wandered into a Christian commune, became a follower of Jesus. And, and has followed Jesus beautifully and selfly, selflessly for, for 40-something years. But my dad suffered a lot. You know, sometimes people, you know, it, 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 he could so easily, you know, be the kind of person who's like, man, everything just went wrong, and I just went and drank my pain away, or, or I, you know, pushed my pain away with a needle. Because my dad, his biological father, wanted basically nothing to do with him. Uh, shortly after he became a Christian, at like the age of like, 29, his mom, who he adored, died of brain cancer. Then his stepfather, who only told him he loved him one time, uh, was murdered by his business partner. <laughs> and, and, and I could just say, so many other times, I've just seen so much suffering in my life. But you know what my dad's favorite verse is? That he has lived out relentlessly, fiercely, is Romans 8.28. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's the verse that I've seen him cling to you know, so many times in my life. And when I look at somebody who's not fragile, when I look at somebody who's not bitter, he's not like jaded or cynical, but he's just full of joy and full of life and, and just this kindness and this generosity. I mean, this is what my dad, he was going in for an eight-hour surgery where they were going to cut out parts of his intestine, cut out parts of his stomach, cut out parts of his pancreas, this eight-hour Whipple surgery, 
And this is what he posted on, on, online. He said, like the night before a big game, excitement, not anxiety, no complaints. My faith needs to work at times like this, and it is. Though he slay me, I will trust him. Let's do this. <laughs> and every time I talk to him, like, the, like that, that's, that's, that's the attitude that he has. So karma versus grace. The last thing is this, instant versus ultimate. We'll wrap this thing up. Instant versus ultimate. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life, nor angels, nor demons, nor, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nothing height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's kind of cool that we're more than conquerors. In Greek, it's hyper-conquerors. That we're hyper, we're super conquerors. It's, it's more than, than conquest. But I think it's really important to realize what it says up in verse 23. I think we've got it on the screen for you. Verse 23, it says, it says that if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. You know, the word secular actually in Latin means now. That's what the word secular means. It means present. Obviously, I don't believe in a hereafter. I just believe in the here and the now. That's what the word secular means. And, and, and if you look at suffering just in the present, like we get so caught up in the instant, we get so caught up in the immediate, like, well, I don't see any point right now to what I'm going through. It feels pointless. It feels worthless. I see nothing good about this. I see no purpose. But, but, but the promise of Scripture is that if we wait patiently, we will ultimately see a good brought out of it. You know, if you were there... You know, 2,000 years ago in, 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 Rome, in, uh, in Jerusalem, and you watch Jesus be crucified, you see him completely naked, hyperventilating, like suffocating to death, bleeding, you would probably go, maybe he's not the Messiah. <laughs> like, yeah, this, this guy ain't it. Like, it was really amazing, but this is like, I don't see the point of it. You would actually feel like God wasn't even there. Maybe you would feel like Yahweh doesn't exist. You know, Jesus cries out on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, maybe you'd feel like God wasn't present at all. It did not look like the salvation of the world. It looked like the end of the world. And yet, after three long days, patiently, what comes? It comes glory. It comes resurrection. I'll give another example, because maybe you're a skeptic here. You're like, I don't really believe in resurrection. I'll give you this example. We know this from history. Tacitus and Pliny are uh, pagan Roman historians. And we know for a fact, based on Tacitus, Pliny, and plenty of other writings, that thousands of Christians are going to go to the sword. They are going to be persecuted. They're, they're going to be you know, ripped apart by animals. They're going to have you know, holes drilled in their head and hot lead poured in. They're going to they're gonna be torn apart. They actually mainly didn't die at the Colosseum. That's a misconception. They mainly died at Nero's Circus and at other amphitheaters. But we know they're torn apart. I don't want to put this picture on the screen for you, a couple pictures. So let's say you're there. We've got a Roman execution. Let's say you're there, and you're standing in a stadium, and you're being butchered. And you go, okay, I guess Caesar is Lord. Caesar's Lord. <laughs> like, we lose. Yeah, and, and, and you look at it, and you feel like there's no hope, and, 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 there, and we know from history that this happened, okay? We know this happened to the early Christians. But what does this text say? It says that in all these things, we're more than conquerors, that after suffering comes glory. What if you could transport one of those Christians from a, from a stadium in Rome to a stadium in Brazil with 180,000 people shouting the name of Jesus, which happened recently. Nobody's singing Caesar's name anymore. What if you could transport someone from that stadium in Greece, that arena, because they were persecuted all throughout the empire, and you could take them to South Korea, which is the largest Christian church on earth with 480,000 people meeting in small gatherings, and then coming together on occasion. Nobody is singing Caesar's name on Sunday mornings, but billions of people are singing the name of Jesus this morning. 
He can bring glory from suffering. And that's just a glimmer of the glory that God claims he's going to bring in eternity, that he's going to bring in the resurrection, that he's going to bring at the new creation. We'll bring the band up on stage, and I'll close here. Turkey experiences some of the worst earthquakes on the planet, and uh, they've had some horrendous earthquakes. And because of that, I was interested to discover that the most indestructible building in the world is in Turkey. There's an airport in Turkey that can withstand an 8.0 earthquake. And, and the way they do this is they do it through what are called base isolation. That there's a base within the structure that it's kind of like uh, shock absorbers on a car. It's like a suspension system on a, on a car. The base absorbs the shock so that the building doesn't. The Bible says that God did not spare his own son but gave him up freely for us all. Jesus took the shock so that you and I wouldn't have to. He absorbed the blow on the cross for our debt, for our sin, for our wickedness. He took the real blow. And if you make the generous, sacrificial love of God in Christ the foundation of your life, you won't be like that mall in Mexico. Your life will go from fragile to indestructible.